Welcome everyone to Los Libertinos podcast. I am your host, Carlos Abelad, and this is Chingazos and Fire episode number 55. Our guest today is Adam Patrick. He was a guest here on episode number 19. So I suggest you check that episode out. If you haven't, I'll put the link below. Uh, he is the host of the Age of Information podcast, where he dives into the intersections of the material and the mystical, logic and magic. He attempts to break down the philosophy and praxis of individual liberty and economic freedom. But most importantly, he's an amigo to the show and he's a homie to me. So uh, welcome. Welcome, man. Thanks for coming back on. Thanks a lot, Carlos. I really appreciate it. And I really need to update that tagline. <laughs> oh, shit. Here we go. Right? You got to update mostly, that? It's mostly correct. Mostly. All right. Fair enough. Well, uh, I thought it sounds pretty good, man. I thought yeah, all that yeah. sounds it, good. It'll suffice for this. Yeah. Uh, so like the last time we talked, um, uh, um, man, that was, uh, episode 19 and that was like, uh, yeah, last year, um, mm -hmm. uh, probably summer, summertime. And, and at that time, um, we, uh, so before I say that anybody that wants to have a more, uh, deep background into, uh, Adam for sure, check that episode out. Like I said, uh, usually we do the background on, on these shows around this time, but, uh, uh, I think uh, we're past that already, man. We uh, we uh, but you know what? For actually, for anybody that might not know you, you can give the you can give the quick rundown of of uh, of your background if you don't mind. The little one two punch. I know you can knock it out pretty fast, just in case. And yeah, I have I new mean, listeners the, since the last time, man. So that's kind of cool. I, I mean the um the the angle I was going at the show back then, or at least you know the show I was doing. Yeah, you're talking over me with Adam Patrick was a, a totally different concept than what I'm trying to approach with the Age of Information. And I'm not going to delete those episodes. Obviously, they're they're a crucial uh, transition point, right, for people to understand sort of uh, my evolution if for some reason they they want to. <clears throat> and you're, you know, everybody's a, a product of their history. So essentially I was trying to figure out coming from a, you know, let's say anarchist background. I never quite adopted the word libertarian, but that kind of economic, you know, economic freedom, individual liberty sort of aspect that you kind of touched on in that tagline, which is from that show and going through COVID and trying to figure out kind of like, like why, why the libertarian kind of praxis wasn't wasn't there why it didn't quite work and i saw this as many of us did basically a pagan religion developing in front of our faces right on tv around us and i i having a background with being being raised roman catholic and then kind of leaving the church and having some issues with christianity western christianity i started kind of getting back into symbolism and quote unquote magic right we maybe we can go into what that what that means but when I saw that the spiritual world was sort of presenting itself in front of my face, it kind of snapped me back into this sort of religious fervor to, to delve into um, like why this was happening and what, you know, in my little milieu of which I thankfully you remember um, what everybody was kind of doing with that information. It was really interesting for me to kind of see it in real time, which is why I wanted to call the show, the age of information, because that's really kind of the, the, um, the foundation that we're all kind of grounded in with our points of view. So it's moving into that sort of dissection of the spiritual world and how it affects our material world and why we can't escape it and why we sought proof of that um, with all the COVID hysteria. So that's kind of, you know, to summarize what I'm doing now. And if people, like you said, wanted to go back and get, you know, post <laughs> this year, Adam, they can, they can do it on uh, episode 19 and they should re-listen to your shows anyway, because they're awesome. Oh, cool, man. Thanks. Uh, yeah, man, I, um, uh, I've been interacting with you, uh, uh, more online, uh, not too much, but I'll throw a little something on your, on your post, but I guess my angle a little bit is that, um, um, so I'm not very religious, but I respect anyone that is, uh, and I pretty much even respect someone that like, really, like really isn't it like, uh, you know, I pretty much uh, as a baseline respect people up front. Uh, I, I don't really try to be negative or anything like on, on stuff, but um, I try to push back a little bit. I don't know if you feel it a little bit, man. I do it with like a, like with just a little bit, just to kind of get interactions a little bit. But uh, uh, let me give you a little bit of the background of, of, of how uh, 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 I came to a little bit of this, but really I, I'm not married to it. 
So I always find it fascinating when you get more into it and, and I read your comments with other people because I can't interact like that good uh, by typing or writing, man. Uh, the, some, some of those, some of your homies there on those chats sometimes can can really get into it with you and, it, and it's fascinating to check out. But um, I'm sure you remember this, uh, this movie. Um, so I, well, I was raised Roman Catholic, but did all the stuff, but like Mexican style, you know, where you, you don't really, you know, I mean, it's not really, at least in my family, it wasn't really put on us. Like as kids, you go, and if you talk a little bit, they fucking pinch you real hard and shit. Like, on, oh fuck and shit like that. But you know, I mean, uh, it, it wasn't really um, forced on us. But uh, we did all the sacraments, I guess. Right, that's what it's called. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, and uh, but like, I don't know, in the mid uh, two thousand, when I was getting into like the Alex Jones and different videos, I had seen that movie Zeitgeist where it kind of gave uh, a different angle on it that I've never heard of, which was just a little bit of like, uh, that maybe a lot of these religions have to do with um, uh, more like uh, cycles of the earth or cycles of like bigger cycles, uh, uh, celestial bodies kind of cycles. And just as humans, we kind of evolved to kind of uh, help us stay grounded a little bit uh, as uh, life isn't always that easy. And uh, I kind of took that that uh, uh, and, 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 and rolled with that for a long time, you know. Um, uh, even in high school, I remember saying um, uh, that I wasn't religious. I, I, I guess I went out of my way a little bit to say that I wasn't. I don't know why, but I would say things like, oh, man, you know, I know when I have kids, when I finally see kids, because I've heard this story about when you have kids, oh, you know, you see, you, then everything changes. But I don't know, man, I, I had kids that uh, by religious connection uh, to the spiritual, like and through religion didn't really happen. Um, I do um, uh, feel that there is something to the cycles of um, the universe, I guess, whatever, whether it's days and years, uh, World Cups every four years, whatever cycles there are. Uh, uh, I tend to follow, I, I, I flow with those kind of cycles. Um, they come natural to me, um, but uh, I've never been very religious. So um, um, I've heard you a little bit mentioned and other people mentioned like, um, you know, just by being a good person, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are a good person in the context of maybe like, uh, you know, Christianity or something like that. Uh, can you kind of, uh, Kind of a, a, a kind of explain a little bit of what that means. Uh, I think in a most recent interview that you had with one of your homies, uh, he used an example. Um, uh, yeah, just because you don't cheat on your wife, it's not even if you're thinking about it. You know, you're kind of are. And I was like, oh shit, what the fuck? Oh man, I was like, that's okay. Well, I was like, well, fuck. I mean, uh, I'm, I I don't know if that means that I'm good or bad, but uh, I definitely like to deal with people in the actions of what people do and not what they might have in their mind, but, you know, I guess kind of freestyle on that a little bit, mm -hmm. but yeah. Well, I, I mean, I would say that's a, that's a pretty good summation sort of of the modernist positive argument, right? That's sort of what the general, you know, libertarian ethos consists of, right? It's, it's like, I want to be a good person. Being a good person is hard. It's a struggle. I'm working through things. And there's, there's nothing about that that is in any way incompatible with Christianity. Right. But what what the modern world has sort of done to us, and it, it did this to me to some extent, too, because, you know, let me preface this real quick, because I have a feeling we're going to get deep and I just don't I want to make something clear to the listeners. Um, I'm not a trained theologian. I don't have my MDiv or Ph.D. Right. I someday would like to do those things so that I have some sort of, quote unquote, authority to stand on if I write a book or something. But I, I've always approached kind of learning about pretty much anything I've learned about is a hobby, right? So I sporadically over the course of 30 years, you know, I'm almost 41. So, you know, of course of catechizing in the Roman Catholic church and then kind of leaving the Roman Catholic church and seeing the various flavors of Protestantism that had sprouted up in my life, um, just sort of had, and I, and I grew up with the, you know, philosophy and mythology and English professor for a father and a therapist for a mother. So I, I had, you know, books and learning and access to everything. So Christianity for me was kind of a hobby. Hold on, let me interrupt real quick. I want to give people like perspective. I've heard you say that you have a lot of the Bible memorized. I mean, that to me is like, a, did you, no. I think, no, 
No. Okay. All right. I thought he's, no, no, I thought no. I've heard you say you have a lot of those like passage, a lot of those passages, a lot of those things. Remember? Okay. No. My bad, man. Okay. Go ahead. My bad. No. And and actually, I think that's kind of important because <clears throat> what you'll find a lot of times in our and we'll get into this a little bit more later. I I hope um, you'll find people sort of quoting Bible verses to kind of explain their point. And I I actually actively don't do that. Mm, I think okay. that's a really yeah. dangerous thing to do. And so if I'm going to do anything, I'm going to take an entire chapter or an entire book of the Bible and dissect it in context <clears throat> rather than just because if you pull a verse out you can make it justify anything yeah right? especially when it's written in english which is like one of the most vague languages that's ever existed so <clears throat> but the reason i make that disclaimer is i don't want anyone to for example if i come at a position of somebody looking into the orthodox christianity that i'm in any way qualified to talk about that if if <clears throat> you're qualified to be man you're qualified to be i'm just saying that you know but what what people should do if they're interested in something that i talk about is they should go talk to somebody who is trained in that if I spark an interest in them. So I just wanted to make that disclaimer that I'm not an authority on it. <clears throat> so what kind of the, the modern system has sort of done is it's compartmentalized religion into a, into a box, <clears throat> right? So you have your, your politics in a box, you have your religion in a box, you have your favorite football team in a box, right? And you have your, you know, your family over here and your work over here. And, <clears throat> you know, maybe we won't belabor how we got to that point, but that's the point we're kind of in. And so there's this sort of secular materialist, modernist <clears throat> sort of American liberal viewpoint. And I mean, liberal in the uh, quote unquote classical sense, right. Of sort of keeping all of these things separate. And, and that's an, uh, an anomaly in human history, right? If you go back even middle ages, really, right. But you go back further all the way to the beginning of humanity, that just wasn't the case. You, your identity was a, a, a collaboration or a, a, a melding or mixture of those things, right? And so we've been trained to do that. And the idea is if somebody wants to see how the spiritual reality affected the world, they have to first, I mean, accept the fact that there, there is a spiritual reality to understand it. Um, but if they don't accept it, if they choose not to accept it, it doesn't deny it. It just means they're wandering around in the middle of a battlefield, not realizing there's a battle going on. And that's not really a good way to arm yourself for war. Um, <clears throat> and modern American sort of mixture of Puritanism and paganism and Gnosticism is a really bad representation of what Christianity has almost always been. And it's not really their fault how that got there it's mm, roman catholic church a little bit and i don't want to get too maybe into that right now but no man you can actually i'm following uh if you don't mind let me uh so uh i had i had my cinco de mayo episode um here uh for my uh one year anniversary and i had uh matt buck Mm. Uh, Andrew from Popular Liberty and uh Kyle Anslone from the Libertarian Institute Libertarian Institute but mm -hmm. I had a um, uh, one topic that I uh, kind of uh, came up in the conversation was about demons. And I guess when you're saying that uh, there's a spiritual war going out there, I'm thinking you're talking about like the demons that they might have brought up and that um, they made it. Now you can, you know, if you have, you know, let, you know, interrupt for sure, man. Like, but it's kind of like they were kind of like. Well, haven't you seen these people that want to take your kids and do this and that and 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 they have to be like demonic to do that and 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 they're... and um, I understood the take, and then I also understood uh, the homie Kyle. His take was like, man, they just get in, they get into these power structures and they just uh, the system basically you know turns these people out to be demonic and stuff like that and it's just a, you know so I, I can be in between both um, uh, uh, sides of it, but. Um, I don't, I, I don't, uh, go around this world looking at that. There's a war going on. It's weird, man. Uh, I heard you talk to, uh, uh, one of your episodes, you know, as I, as I prep, I, I always listen to a lot of, uh, content of, you know, home interviewing and you had Matt Erickson on in a couple episodes ago, and he was talking about like buses of demons or buses, like bus, like that. He just sees buses of these things, you know, everywhere. And, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't, but what I do see, like what I see and when I'm driving, when I'm driving around, really what I see is just like capital. 
Like every time I'm driving around, if I see a structure, a building or a restaurant or something or somebody that's poor or somebody that's I'm always just thinking of like capital, you know, uh, how you know, what did that cause? What it is? How much effort that they probably have to put to do that? And what how much effort did he do to have to lose all that? And why is it, does that person have all of their furniture outside? Shit, man, they got literally the kicked out all their furniture. I always just see things in that way. And and it could be good or bad. I don't know if there's demons behind that um uh you know maybe right the person that get kicks out probably i don't know who knows it could be an endless stories you know i mean i don't know i can't really judge without knowing more information but that's kind of the way i see stuff so i mean just so you know that's kind of how i i don't see like demons i just see like i don't know i don't know if it's good or bad but i just it's just capital is always what i see money and things mm-hmm. like that uh uh i don't know i just the way i kind of see things man like have you uh have you heard of the show american gods have you ever watched that mm-hmm so that that's a uh i really like the show it's it's pretty graphic um but i probably most of your listeners don't care about that so i i thought it was a really good show and and what it basically the point of it is is it's got um it looks at the word gods as it pulls in odin and zeus and multiple versions of of christ as as the, an allegory or like the easter bunny or something as <clears throat> sort of whatever people worship becomes the thing that ends up sort of owning them so they sort Mm. of in in this show they human beings sort of create the gods they worship and there's a battle between the old gods like odin or something and new gods which is like technology information the internet and they they have money or like how i do right you're kind of saying right 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 right. so like what i see in capital right it's everywhere right you know and i you know i want the action like whatever people are worshiping at that moment in history they're giving power to an entity that already exists that then sort of ends up owning them as the human, right? The entity ends up owning them. So the the show is not specifically Christian. Um, what's really interesting, is there's a scene um, with the goddess of Easter. I can't remember her name. It was Ishtar or something. And there's like 15 or 20 different versions of Jesus walking around in this in this conglomeration of gods showing that people have a very different idea, you know, in modern times of what he is. Um, so it's not That's a Christian cool. show, but it, it's a really good conceptual viewpoint, kind of, of a starting point, maybe to see this reality. But from, from a Christian point of view, this is really hard because modern American Western Christianity just doesn't, it's devolved to a point where it basically is just atheism, right? Basically. And, and so when I talk to people and I talk about Christianity, Oftentimes what I'm talking about is about as much of a polar opposite of what they hear in the word Christianity as could possibly be. It's almost easier to talk to somebody who is like 18, 19 years old, raised in like an atheist household, but doesn't even really know what Christianity is. It's almost easier to talk to them than to have somebody who like, like me, maybe grew up and left and has this bad taste in their mouth, but rather than do you know, 20 years of sort of research into the early church just kind of left it, right? It's very difficult because we're not speaking the same language. And so what I try to do is get people to go and, you know, look at what Christianity was. Like it's an extension of a particular strain of Second Temple Judaism, right? That um, continues that lineage. It doesn't just pop into existence, right? Or is created by the Apostle Paul or something. It's a continuation of that lineage. And then you go back and you look, well, what were they doing in that first 300 years or so before the Council of Nicaea, right? And what they were doing there is very heavily documented, right? It, it's, it's, if I talk to Protestants, a lot of times they'll say like, well, there's this great apostasy that happened somewhere in between the death of the apostle St. Paul and the Council of Nicaea. And, you know, we're creating, we're going back to that, right? Our, and I don't even know what the Council of Nicaea is, man. Either way, it's, there, there's a council of people and they did some stuff. It's this, but this is the argument that you'll get from a lot of, a lot of Protestants. Right. And it's like, well, where did you get that from? Because we're living in 2022, not 1522. You, you can actually go see what the church fathers were writing. Like the people who St. John and St. Paul like taught who knew them in real life, right. What they were writing about. So we can do that now. Cause we have like the internet, right. So my my idea is sort of to get people to see that. And if they can see that as a starting point, they find that interesting. They find that, well, that's not 
hellfire and brimstone. That's not once saved, always saved. That's not whack your hand with a ruler by the nun in the third grade. It's not any of those things, right? And then <clears throat> if that interests them enough, find somebody who's got a lot more knowledge on it than me or let me point you in a direction of somebody like that and let them roll with it. Because what we're presented as Christianity in the modern West is very easy to just disregard. Like to be totally fair, it's very easy to go, well, can I just be a good person? And it's yeah, like, I mean, that's well, what I do. I mean, it's, it's right. really what I'm, what I do. And then also in, just like you said, like find somebody else. No, no, man, I, I found you, I'm talking to you. So I'm, I mean, I am interested. So, what, so, what's, so what's even I, I want to know what you're, right. I, when, when, the way you present it on, on, online and stuff like that, it's interesting, man. I, I am interested in, in it. And even if I already straight up told you that, like, I don't see it like in demon form, I can accept that whatever I saw, what, what, what you said is, is, is a form of like, I'm already, I'm on another, not on another, uh, I'm just on another plane right now, but it doesn't mean that I, that I, I can, I can grasp that you're seeing things in your plane or like Matt sees things in buses of demons or whatever, or people see different things and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, you know, but, but, but uh, I'm still like, I'm following, man. I'm following you. To, to be fair to Matt, that was an analogy, right? I don't think he literally sees buses of demons, but it was, yeah, it was an interesting. He has a very good way of being like manipulative with analogies that, that I really like and very colorful with them. But um, what, what resonated with me is realizing that, well, two things, the idea of like, quote unquote, being a good person had to come from somewhere, right? Because if you go back and look at, you know, uh, Socrates, for example, Socrates thought he was, quote unquote, being a good person. Right. But he was a demon worshiping pederast. Right. So I mean, I don't even know what, 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 times, a, a what fest, a what fest? Uh, he had sex with the young boys. Oh, okay. That's what, he, that's what he did. That's what he thought perfect love was, was to have sex with prepubescent boys. Right. And worship demons. That's what he did. So that is a little bit fixed when we get to Aristotle, but we've sort of, as a modern culture, sort of rewritten our morality back as a response to a corruption of Christianity and not realizing that our morality that we have now, the way we see our morality comes directly from Christianity, period. And the way we say, you know, I'm being a good person in 2022 in the United States of America is not how anybody ever would have seen that definition prior to Christianity, right? It just didn't exist in the world. So that is something that a lot of, and you're not, I don't think an atheist maybe, but, um, it's it's something atheists don't understand like yeah my, my my time is so uh my time is so flowy that i don't even consider myself really i just consider whatever i mean like uh i wouldn't even want to be like uh you know but I, i'm open to whatever you know but but um have you heard i'm i'm, I'm sure you have but uh cuz you're saying that about how the concepts that we have now as what is a good person uh yeah, that that, that those are like, a, it's an old lineage of like, you know, traditions of like law and canon law, and then whatever types of law that went from like, um, I guess from like, uh, however, it went through like, the English common law and all of that stuff. But have you uh, there's this one guy, man, he's a Harvard guy, I emailed him, man, but uh, he ain't gonna he ain't gonna reply back. But if he does, that'd be pretty cool. But uh, his theory is that uh, basically, like early Christian and or then most then more than mostly then the, the Catholic Church uh, basically just uh, got rid of, uh, you know, like, uh, what does they call it? Like where you're like uh, banging your sisters and brothers and your first cousins and all that. And basically you just incest. got rid. Yeah, incest. But yeah, ba yeah. But like, OK, yes, basically. And then like but even like first cousins and then like they just started spreading it out. So that way they made that taboo enough where and then they just did laws like you can pass your money down to your actual heirs instead instead of having like your your fucking tío and your what your other brother fight for whatever it is like you can actually pass your so that a lot of that had a lot to do with mm. of how we're we are we now understand why what it is to be good like yeah we just know don't bang that's where even like the term sister-in-law brother-in-law come in because it's in-law because it's like meant it's still like canon law lineages I don't know. That sounds pretty straightforward to me. And I respect that. I'm like, oh, shit. Like I, when I heard that, I was like, that makes a lot of sense to me of why, uh, you know, uh, back in the day would have been pretty normal to, you know, incest and do and shit like that. And and to keep your tr your clans real close and not fuck with a lot of people. But then you 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 you, you outlaw those uh, those types of uh, rules. And then you have to kind of venture out a little bit to get a. Uh, 
uh, other, I don't know. I mean, that sounds uh, like a, also just to push back a little bit, like a good reason of why it's not even a pushback. I'm just saying like that also played a big role, you know, like uh, I don't know if it did or didn't, but uh, that guy makes the case and I I, I kind of like a little bit. I don't know his name, man. I, I wish I, I'm not good with names. But... Yeah. You'll have to find it and send it to me. I'm guessing he's probably a, a scholar of some sort. So if we're not careful, um, uh, incest is going to be normalized again. It's getting very close right in our world. But to, to speak to his point that uh, if you're, articulating it accurately that he's making um those quote unquote laws are in the torah they're in the first five books of the old testament so the roman catholic church with which didn't exist as a separate entity until 1054 ad right didn't come up with that that's always been back to i mean if we want to date you know the the torah like genesis exodus numbers leviticus deuteronomy if we want to date that to somewhere between 1200 to 2000 bc right that's how the ancient israelites were commanded to live then so it's not a modern invention like the idea of god's order has always existed in what we would call christianity it's not a um it's not an invention i mean if if you i guess you could say the roman catholic church kind of i think he was just uh i think he does give credit to like early christian christian sex sex uh starting that off and then i guess he was just kind of giving a side of uh that the roman catholic ended up being the most powerful because they actually started fighting for you know the 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 rights to uh and testimony pass down your 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 wealth or whatever so then if you didn't have anybody that you passed it down to a lot of people then just gave it to the church so over centuries of like everybody passing down not having some somebody to pass down there because now there was less uh brothers and sisters and first cousins and second cousins they didn't get married they didn't have kids they passed their stuff over to the church and over time the church really then that's you know that's one you know but you know he gives credit to the early to 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 early uh he didn't mention uh the jewish stuff uh unless he did and i wasn't paying attention but right know, he's, he's uh, probably, he basically says probably, that it's like yeah he probably he's did probably, he's probably a protestant so reality started somewhere around like 1400 a.d but the ideas that you're expressing go back about 2000 years earlier than that. And we're, we're the foundation of the ancient Israelite co covenant with Yahweh in the old Testament. So yeah, cool. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that stuff, man. That's cool. So that's what and it is. It so just, it doesn't sound like he did either. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So, okay. I, I only said it cause that's new to me, you know, right. like, so I'm just, I'm trying to see well, like, if, hey, have you heard this good. stuff before? You know, like it's a really good example of how people in positions of authority and you know this as somebody who would identify with libertarianism, are, are basically full of shit most times, right? Because what what is somebody who gets a PhD other than somebody who is able to pass a bunch of tests and write a bunch of papers and publish some journal articles, right? It, it doesn't really require you to have to think at all. It just requires you to suffer through enough schooling and memorize enough stuff and regurgitate it. And usually it's a product of whatever professor is helping you write your thesis or your dissertation. So you end up sort of emulating that person's viewpoint and that person might also be equally full of shit and have, <laughs> have gone through the same process right we saw this with the medical community with like the pharmaceutical community and fauci and all that like just because you have a big fancy shiny thing doesn't really qualify you to say any but you know people still compartmentalize that right a, a lot of times the same I probably butchered that guy's thesis or whatever man i just probably want to be not fair. no yeah. you probably didn't but but also you know what's funny you said liberty uh uh the most recent post that i saw on him or something when i was uh, he got an award from the hayek institute or whatever you know that makes so sense. You're, you're like that makes sense right How do you yeah, that, makes sense. Yeah, that, that all that all vibes that all tracks yeah 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 well it's 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 here's the thing right that i encounter with uh i'm still you know facebook friends with a lot of libertarians and so they, they're naturally distrustful of all of these authority figures right until religion comes up and then all of a sudden this scholar said this and this scholar said this and this scholar said this as some sort of proof of something and it's like man you just spent the entire last three years telling everybody how people in positions of authority are full of crap and then you're like but this in this case right we're going to separate christianity off all these people are basically talking about how christianity's stupid and atheism's great and the world started 500 years ago we're going to totally accept that right it's a very inconsistent view of authority figures and i'm not saying that we should believe everybody either but it's almost like when it comes down to to christianity specifically not even like islam or modern rabbinical judaism like those two things 
are like, you can't touch those, right? You can't touch Islam and Judaism, but Christianity is all about, well, what did the atheist product, you know, the ex Protestant atheist scholars say Christianity was. And it's like, that guy doesn't even know there's like a Torah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not even fair to modern Jews <laughs> to not acknowledge their scriptures are, well, not worded exactly the same, but in essence, the same book it's, you know, it's, it's a deviation of the same religion. So that, um, yeah, that authority thing, I think with libertarians always kind of, kind of crack me up a little bit. It's very inconsistent. Hey, what's up everyone. Just wanted to tell you about our sponsor. It is uh, Paloma Verde CBD from Paloma Verde CBD.com. Uh, it's a small, uh, business that, uh, my wife and I own and, uh, we want to tell you about some uh, new products that we have. Well, especially one. Uh, check it out. These little homies right here. Five milligrams of uh, Delta 9 in each one. Um, the story behind some of these was that uh, when we were first uh, uh, trying them out from our supplier, uh, I took two of them and I remember telling my wife, you know, I like to drink, right? If you're watching this episode, you see I have a little glass of tequila with me there. And uh, and uh, we're going to watch our uh, late night movies is where we usually do our hangouts. And and I was like, you know what? Uh, I don't want to drink. I'm kind of feeling uh, these gummies coming up a little bit. And uh, yeah, no, these things get you high, okay? So get yourself some of these for sure. And then, um, that's funny. Uh, and then when we had them, we were uh, just going sass, 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 at a party, right? My wife's party about uh, about a month ago. And everybody that wanted some got some. And usually these parties are, uh, you know, as a host of a party, we always like to party. You always got to make sure who has drinks. Everybody's having fun. You know, you, you, you're you hosting, you know? And on this one, it was different where uh, some friends came in later on and they're like, why is the party all kind of mellow? And we told them, we gave everybody uh, samples of our new... Uh, Delta nine, five milligram gummies. And uh, everybody was mellow, man. It was it was a trip. I remember just uh, everybody was playing pool, listening to the music kind of low. Everybody was getting, it was cool. So get these uh, five uh, milligram THC uh, gummies at palomaverdecbd.com. Use the promo code CHINGASOS, C-H-I-N-G-A-S-O-S for 20% off of your order and um, support the show and uh, small business. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, man. And uh, sorry, I, I I know we went on a side track and you were, we were, I think we were talking a little bit about, uh, man, about like, how I, I think, yeah. Um, well, I just want to say that, man, you know what, we went on a tangent a little bit, but it was my fault. Um, so then what do you see in this war of when I brought up the term demons? Um, uh, like how, then how do you see it like you know what what is your perspective on 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 hmm. that well my my perspective is the perspective of um basically everybody up until the enlightenment which was that there is a spiritual reality um the the same gods lower g gods that pagans worship right um exist in christianity right they always did until it was kind of creepy to talk about them in the middle ages but they always did in the early church. They always did in Second Temple Judaism. They always did in ancient Israel. They always did in the in the entire on the entire planet. Can you give some examples? And, no, I I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I mean. like the Aztecs. Okay. Violence, right. Like they they're worshiping gods. Uh, the, the Greeks, the Romans, the Chinese. The oh, okay, okay, like that. Oh, oh, not specific. Uh, not like they integrated into the same. It's just that everybody did worship some type of god. Is what you're saying? Yeah, and they believe those things to be real. Okay, okay, right? okay. They, they didn't have a, a modern viewpoint where it was like you could believe it was real or you could not believe it was real, right? Everybody knew it was real. They just they lived their lives as if it was real, right? They didn't they, there wasn't there was no atheists <laughs> in human history until like the 1500s, right? Did that just didn't exist as a concept. Mm. So <clears throat> it's the perspective I take is that perspective. And it, it's it seems simplistic to say that, but when when you when you when you see that and then you see what happens when you stop seeing that that it doesn't make the world better it makes it considerably worse so all of the things that libertarians for example and anarchists are looking at around the world and going this is people are killing each other there's coercion and violence and rape and murder mass genocide right control government control like 
all of, all of this stuff, right? It's not like anything got better when the enlightenment happened, right? And I'm not saying that the enlightenment shouldn't have happened or that we shouldn't have scientific progression and we shouldn't have technology. We shouldn't have these tools. You know, I don't know if we should or shouldn't, right? But the idea that like we're in a better place because we've denied reality, which I'm going to say is just reality, we that we're in some better place, um, I think is very foolish, right? Because what's the product of the last two world wars or the 30 years war in England or literally like all the war, even, even go back to the crusades. I'm not going to let the Catholics off the hook, right? They, they were already into scholasticism at that point. They were basically modernists. Right. And so what do you get? Like what, what is so great about denying reality when at least if you, if not you, I say you, I don't mean you Carlos, right? If you um, <clears throat> sort of deny the spiritual realm, you're sort of just floating around, like I said, in the middle of a battlefield, like not realizing there's a battle going on. And you're going to be in incredibly uh, unequipped to deal with something like COVID, right? Once, once it was very clear to me and many others that there was something happening when COVID hit like the three month mark back in like early 2020, that this was going to be a religion it was, it became very obvious to me that religion, quote unquote, religion or spirituality or the spiritual is the default position that human beings are going to default to either the forces of good or the forces of evil, but they can't have neither as in there is no neutral ground. There, there actually is no such thing as the secular. There has to be one or the other. And if you take that viewpoint and you just kind of slowly move your way backward from today and sort of keep going <laughs> 200, 300, 400, five, everything sort of makes sense. Like there is no neutral ground. You're either on the side of the forces of order, which I should say, instead of good order or the forces of disorder or chaos. And those forces will continue to play out in the world, whether anyone acknowledges them or not. And I just think it's better to acknowledge it <laughs> rather than sort of de like, I don't deny that this, these eyeglasses are in front of me because I can see them, but I can also see like the effects of, of things that I can't see. Right. Like I don't, I can't see oxygen, but I'm breathing and I'm alive. Right. So there are things happening that we cannot directly perceive with our five senses that we know are there. And when we see the effects of them, for example, the fact that I'm not choking to death right now through lack of oxygen, we can kind of realize that they exist without are needing to perceive them directly. So I, maybe that's a good kind of summary or see where you want to go with that. Yeah, I um, uh, what I thought about right now was uh, and again, because, you know, I'm, I'm, as I'm talking to you, I'm checking myself, you know, a little bit, you know, because, uh, well, you know, you got to. Um, and uh, I remember when COVID started after two weeks is when I was like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. But the reason I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, was because, again, right, how I was saying I see capital everywhere or just the money stuff was like, the only things after two weeks when it was like real, where everybody respected it, no matter what side, at least here in town, in San Antonio, for sure, because this is where I live, like, whatever side of the aisle you were, chaos or order, you respected the first two weeks. Mostly everybody respected the first two weeks, hmm. and um, as I did. And, uh, and after the first two weeks, then you started hearing news like... Um, uh, you know, businesses are going to shut down or, or, or mandatory uh, closings and stuff like that. But the only, the only action that was going on was uh, municipal work, state highways, all of that stuff. Right. And me that I know some of this stuff, I was like, yeah, they won't stop that because they're, they're, there's, they're bonded jobs. And if the state stops, stops them any more than this time, the contractor is going to ask for change orders. It's going to be a lot. So I was like, yeah, they're, you know, everybody else can get fucked, but not the, not, you know, you know, not this bonded work where there's going to be change orders involved. So they're not going to, so they're going to get it back going because, so I remember that I did okay. Not okay. Not okay. We had a, a private business, a, our Paloma Verde business. We had a store that went to shit. Like the, we had the store, you know, because of COVID, but because I work close with like city work and, and contract work, like parks and shit like that. After two weeks, like we went back to work because, you know, they wanted you to start the projects back on. You had deadlines, you had this and that. And so I remember just thinking back then, I was like, yeah, it, it, the, the, the action of who's in the mix depends on like the situation of like the numbers and, and the financial numbers of, of, of the things. And, 
And then, um, and then after that, then everything kind of started. But I just remember back then being like, at, once I started hearing that, when it wasn't fair, like where it wasn't like, okay, everybody stay off or everybody come back on when it was selective to like contracts that were close to the government, then I knew that uh, it, it wasn't what it was meant to be that like, mm. you know, I mean, not what it wasn't meant to be that it, it, that there was some type of, I wouldn't say charade, people died, people that I know died, but it was overhyped. It was mm. overhyped. And that's when it kind of started feeling like uh, something's going on here. So, but, mm-hmm. you know, I'm just, I guess I'll just say that to like, uh, uh, at that time, uh, I didn't see it as in good or bad. I just saw it like, where's the action at? And then the action kind of gave me some of the perspective that I had. And then being a business owner, and you know this, like I, I purposely went to any restaurant that was willing to be open. And I purposely posted online the food I was eating because, you know, I want people to get action because that sucks that the government is shutting down people and making them. And I wanted to show that there was still action out there. So, hey, okay, go eat, go be, don't be scared and shit like that. So, I mean, that was my vibe of it again, right? Being the, trying to be a good person or whatever, you know, uh, uh, but, you know, um, that's how I remember how I saw it. And I guess I'm still trying to capture a moment as I'm listening to you. I'm trying to capture a moment where uh, I maybe do uh, see the spiritual. Um, I know uh, one turning point that made it more uh, uh, in sync with a little bit of my uh, upbringing and culture and understanding is like the stuff that I got in my background. Right. Like after that movie Coco hit. Mm. You could just see like the difference in like everybody accepting like the Day of the Dead. Uh, did you like a, that movie? I, I thought it was cool, man. Yeah, yeah like it was I good. Too. I thought yeah. it was cool too. So we just watched. That was my daughter's first year. Uh, her, oh, her, she just turned one. My youngest, and we had a, a Coco screening for the Coco, and a lot of families were out here. It was like a beautiful thing, man. It was nice, and uh, but that was the movie that. So the new to me, I think that that is cool to think that there the spirits are amongst us on those days, and. Um, and that, like, yeah, if you're a good person, you'll get, you get, you, 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 you'll still be put on somebody's ofrenda. And if you're not a good person, you won't be, or some shit like that. I don't know. That seems pretty straightforward to me. But that was actually, it's funny that a cartoon movie turned a lot of like the people to get more into that. And and I think that's okay. I don't, I, you know, I mean, I, I think it's nice to think that my grandma and my grandpa and the people back here, they're listening to this conversation, and she's probably still trying to pinch me, like go more to church or some shit or you know and you know i I just like the idea of that so i envision that that's but it's all like in good vibes i mean i'm not envisioning something like bad or nothing but right you know or even if one of them was bad and not everybody was perfect you know i'm trying to think of the good of 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 them or whatever stuff like that so i guess i still i'm still on the thinking positive side of things but yeah and and that's good i mean it's it's certainly better than the opposite (laughs) right yeah yeah like yeah like hey don't put those pictures up they did some bad stuff like no no i ain't gonna vibe like that they're not even here to defend uh, themselves the idea sort of expressed by that movie uh as to the spiritual world is is not exactly how it's laid out biblically but it's it's a good approximation of what a lot of people kind of feel about it and it's also it was a cool movie right but i was thinking about something when you were talking you were saying kind of when you sort of started to realize that covid was sort of a nothing burger was kind of when the capital started flowing. And before that, for those first two weeks, everybody, including myself, were trying to figure out sort of, is it going to be big or is it not going to be big? And that's a very astute, I think, an accurate observation that once once we saw that the world was going, the, the world of the powerful, the materially in this world, human being powerful elites, right? Once they were going to be okay, that's sort of right that uh, right around that two to three week mark. And you saw, oh, all the systems that were operating <clears throat> pre COVID pre Wuhan, right now, they're all operating exactly the same way, but they're all juiced up, right? They got, they got all the turbo boost in there, right? The supercharger and the, you know, the, the fast and the furious, you know, nitro boost, right. <clears throat> but they're still doing what they were always doing. And once you saw that, I think it was like, okay, well, this is like you, like you said, this is going to be nothing. What What's, scary to think about though was or is what would have happened if it really was something if it really was like a a globe a really was a global pandemic like an ebola breakout and i know people are going to say ebola can't really be a pandemic but you get my gist in the in in the made-up situation right if it was really serious i mean there wasn't an answer anywhere in the world for this if it really was what the covid cult was making it out to be and people were just dropping dead in the streets in our modern world, 
nobody in positions of power had any way to deal with this at all. We'd be toast. There's nothing. There was no hospitals. There was no military. Like, you know, it's if you've ever read Stephen King's The Stand, that's what it would have been. Right there. We, we don't have in place any infrastructure, human or spiritual or in any any form to be able to deal with anything like that any more than somebody living a thousand years ago did. Really? I mean, what could we like the people with the most power would have done what the people in the most power did during the bubonic plague? Just get the hell out of there. <laughs> Try to survive somewhere where there aren't any peasants around. Like that's exactly what would have happened here. <clears throat> Once that didn't happen then we're like, oh, well, everyone's just doing what they were always going to do, right? And then this little religion forms because people are just sort of empty. And that was that was the religion part. Religion was like Fauci becomes the high priest and the mask becomes the communion or the, the shot becomes the communion and the mask becomes like the crucifix. Like there's all these symbols and sigils that sort of mirror the, the inverse of Christianity because people just, they have that structure in their heads. And they have to express it somehow, but they can't be Christian. So they have to get they have to get the thing that's in them naturally that they don't recognize out some in a material way. And mm. what it ends up looking like is an inverse of Christianity because that's the natural pattern. It has to. It has to look like something like that. So those I think those two things were really important, kind of what you brought up, which I 100 percent agree with. And then recognizing the symbolism of a religion in the inverse, because that's the default position and always will be, especially in times of crisis. And even though we weren't really in a time of crisis for rational actors like you and I, these people and I say these people, so I don't want to get your channel demonetized or what or kicked off of YouTube or anything. But, um, <clears throat> you know, these people sort of needed to fill that gap with something um and they didn't have an outlet for it because most of them are rabid pagan atheists right like they're huge into abortion they're you know what i mean like any, anything you can think of that just is like ugh, gross right these are the people advocating for those things and not everybody like you know my my aunt isn't you know she was legitimately scared of covid but i don't think of her when i think of the quote unquote covid cult or covid crazies i think of like the people on tv right like those people are just doing the natural thing so i think yeah i think that's a that's a really astute point people forget we, we're three years removed you know from almost right or no basically october was when it really started 2019 november right yeah. and the further you get removed the, the more you can kind of forget like how obvious everything was back then, you know, 30 the, years from now, who knows if people will even still be talking about it this way. Yeah. The, and I, um, you know, someone that I also respect, uh, and, 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 and I agreed because, uh, I was, you know, jamming a lot of what you guys were jamming a lot of the people about how really the, the, the one, one, well, one of many groups, but the one that really did, uh, were able to kind of handle this a little bit better where like the religious people that you know were able to still try to attend church or try to as much as they can attend churches and attend that and and i remember that uh you know uh 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 you know i'm a fan of bill maher and you know he's an atheist or whatever i mean he made the movie or whatever like atheism or whatever and he gave a lot of props he was like hey you know what like i you know they did better than people like me you know you know, they they were able to connect with their friends and family through the religion and stuff like that. And and um, and 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 I remember seeing a lot of that. Um, uh, I I had my connections just through family. It wasn't religious. It's just that, you know, geographically and, you know, we just live real close, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but um, but uh, yeah. And, and, and I say that because uh, uh, it was kind of like um, like I would assume now that so okay so check this out like i so back when i would go to the restaurants my daughter would have been like two or something and and uh, again purposely we would all go to go my, my oldest daughter go eat to restaurants and i remember just telling my wife i was like because we're actively and aggressively going to restaurants and having her socialize and, and not being one of these uh, kids that is going to be isolated i was like she is going to be advanced in social skills. That's going to make her again. You know, I guess I guess I see it in money. Right? I was like, she's going to be okay. She's going to be able to maneuver a lot because she's just going to be advanced from everybody else. Um, I think the same thing about religious people that like th that were still doing a lot of their activity, their normal activities uh, of uh, you know being with like their uh, uh, church and all that. Uh, 
that they're going to be a more advanced uh, position. And advanced, I, I mean, I guess also too, like uh, financially, I guess spiritually, uh, uh, the connections they made, the ones that they really made, especially in those times when they couldn't make any other connections, they were just a little bit more closer. Um, uh, uh, what do you say to something like that? Like, are we going to see the 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 exponential like separation of like oh you could just gonna tell who dealt with COVID in one way and who didn't and 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 uh like uh, is that gonna be something we're gonna see or or is it just gonna meld like you just said right now like we might just forget and not even talk about it and maybe it'll just like you know you know uh what, how do you think that might play out some of that mm. um I I think if there's something that you know, and it's it's hard for me to speak to humanity in general here. I think it probably is applicable to humanity in general, but it's definitely applicable to folks in um, in in Christian influenced areas, right? That um, we sort of have this innate ability to come together in wartime, and I mean that in a broad sense, not like actual war. Like for example, when I was in basic training in the military, you know, you're with however many other guys, like. I don't know, 20, 30 guys in like your little unit. Right. And y'all look the same because you're sh clean shaven and you're all wearing the same clothes. Right. And you sort of have to go through this struggle together. And if you don't work together, you're not going to get through it together or individually. Right. There has to be some sort of cohesive, cohesive unit. This is probably true of humankind. Right. But different cultures maybe don't have the same. They haven't worked out the muscles the same way that our, you know, cultures have. Right. Um, and then when I graduated basic training, it was interesting. This, this is in San Antonio at Lackland, right? Back in 2001. Oh, like, shit, homie. Oh, you were, you were a homie, dude, dude, back in the day, man. Dude. So we would go down to the Riverwalk, right? And, <laughs> and everybody got to wear their civvies, right? They got to wear the clothes from the real world that you go to Lackland wearing before you have to wear the camis, right? And like there's goths and there's skaters and there's BMXers and there's, you know, like uh, FUBU and, you know, rap clothes and, and you're like, oh man, this is such a diverse group of people. I never even really thought about it. We were just kind of all the same going through that struggle together. And if there's one thing about Christian influenced cultures and, and really to be completely blunt Christianity, period, it flourishes in tough times and it doesn't do well in, in good times, which is, mm. To, to really hammer this home, one of the reasons there's such a difference of spiritual uh, level up between Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholicism, because Rome actually saved and built a civilization from ruins, and the East was mostly subjugated by the Ottoman Turks until the early 1900s. So their view of how they receive the material and the spiritual world is completely different because half of the planet who's Christians was constantly suffering under somebody else's thumb, whereas Rome hold was- Hold on, hold on. Say, say that again. Oh, sorry, man. Sorry, say that again. So so the Eastern Orthodoxy had it harder until like, uh, until the Turkish, like uh, that whole thing went down, like when the, the Ottoman Empire, I guess, what, like- right, Because the, 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 the Roman Catholic Church was the authority in Western Europe, right? Or in like the majority of Europe. They literally, like Tom Wood's book says, built Western civilization, right? Eastern Orthodoxy Christianity didn't build anything, right? It was the, from nine, from the early 1400s until 1904, right? They were under the Ottoman Turk rule. So I'm, I'm not saying they didn't like, they didn't have a civilization, but they weren't the ones in charge. And by not being in charge and by the ones being the ones who weren't setting the cultural example right? Living under the thumb and they were persecuted and murdered, maybe not so much as other people have been, but in a lot of places like Greece, they were decimated. Right. And not being the one sort of in charge does lend itself better to preserving early Christianity. It tends to Christianity tends to get corrupted during peacetime. It just does. And for example, then when we weren't in basic training anymore and we all kind of went out into our jobs and started doing our fields in the military, you don't really feel that camaraderie anymore, right? You can come and go at the end of the day, you clock out from your job. And, but then if you go overseas, you sort of get back into it again, right? Now it's your brothers and your sisters over there fighting the enemy, right? We're all together. Then you come home and you kind of lose track of people and you're not really sick. So there, there is within the ethos of the Christian influ influenced world, 
something about bonding together in wartime and dissolving in peacetime. So if you're to go back to your question, do I think we'll look back and we'll look at this as if it's like very fuzzy or kind of blacked out um, <clears throat> as a culture? I think we will. And that's why it's so important to have these conversations, record them and post them for posterity so that they're there so that our Facebook posts from three years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago, while they might be infantile <laughs> to the more adult version of ourselves that we are now, are constant historical reminders of what happened and what we saw so that we can discuss that later. And it, it, just to nail in the coffin on that, P. Quinones did a, did a show. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to forget who it's with, so I apologize. But it was a very recent one. And it was talking about um, the books the Nazis burned. And yeah, that was with uh, Justin Campbell. He's the producer of the show. Perfect. Yep, exactly right. Fact check this podcast. I'm yes. actually going to talk to Justin this week. So I'll oh, perfect, man. Yeah, he's, he's a homie for sure. But one of the points that Pete said is that the, you know, the burning of the books was a huge mistake because now not that I'm going to come on here and be a Nazi apologist. I, I'm definitely not in that, in that camp at all, but the evidence that you could have maybe looked back to and said, well, look, the books that they were burning were actually stuff that maybe we don't agree with either. Right. We don't agree with the Nazis murdering people and enslaving people and destroying, you know, half, half, you know, half their area. But we also, would like to be able to show that like the pornography and the incestual writings and all of these horrible graphic murderous things and, you know, devolved publications, we might not burn them in modern day America. Right. But we might shun them, but we don't have that evidence because they literally did burn them. So now when somebody says, well, what were they burning? They were burning the Bible. They were burning uh, Aristotle. You're like, that's just conjecture. We don't know. We have no idea. There's no historical record of what those books were because obviously they were burned. So I think it's important to have as many of these conversations as possible and grow together through them so that they're there so that we can go, no, 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 no. That's not what happened, right? It didn't happen like that. It happened like this. And here's the proof. We can go back and we can look at all of us talking about this in real time and we won't lose. Like we don't have to write it down and put it in a, in a time capsule or, you know, save it in a monastery somewhere freehand, right? We could actually use technology now to preserve history the way it actually happened so that we don't, and we still have our perspectives on it, right? We're not all mirror images of each other, but um, I think that's really important. And that's, I think that's one of the best reasons to do these things as much as possible to keep it in the historical record so that, yeah, we have to not main, we can maintain a culture of peace, but, but not get complacent to the point where we forget that we really are all on this together, especially from a Christian point of view. I mean, we're all, every human being on the planet's the same from a Christian point of view, right? Like we have different potentialities and powers and right. Our ability to be good at certain things and not, but we're all equal in the eyes of God. There is no difference, right? It's all whether we're focused on him or we're not, that's the only difference. So I think, again, I think this is really important. So we don't fall into that trap later. Yeah. I, um, no, man, 100% for that. Um, I... Hey, what's up, guys? I uh, just wanted to let you know about a podcast that I've been jamming for about a year now. It's called The Morning After Podcast. It plays at 7.30 Central, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, Justin and the crew, uh, Matt, Dag, and Clyde are my uh, gringo homies that... Uh, Man, they, they they put a cool spin on the the topics of the of the of the day. Um, they uh, it's meant to be a light show with serious topics, but they put their uh, gringo spin on it. And uh, yeah, I mean for sure it's a little edgy. If that's not your vibe, uh, don't check them out. But if you like to have a, a laugh and uh, maybe catch me on the chats there. Uh, for sure, tune, tune in to the morning after podcast. Um, I'll put a link at the bottom. Uh, please go hit subscribe on them. Check them out and uh, support our sponsor. And uh, see you there. I, uh, you know, earlier when I was talking about how I see like a lot of stuff in like capital, I also see a lot of stuff in like football terms, you know, football is life. And and I and, and and I've meshed both of them where, you know, 
my wife knows there's no there's no what is it what's the word uh, uh, i'm not even gonna say that. Uh, uh, ambiguity i think or like there's no there's no it's like i want to have enough residual income so we can go to the biggest football matches in the world or boxing matches in the world as a family and enjoy life as as much as we can because we only got one one ride here at least that's the way i kind of see it so i bring that up to kind of ask you a little bit of uh if you think that um sports whether they're team sports or individual sports um uh, from the perspective of the person the people that are playing them and from the people that are watching them if they uh <clears throat> tap into the meta, uh, metaphysical uh, uh if they have a way of uh of uh somehow just like a um uh, you know and i say with all respect but you know just so people know like uh, like a church might have the way that the architecture and all of this uh you know can get people in the zone by you know whatever i don't know latin mass or this or the or the the, the you know all that stuff like that whole temple that has been built <clears throat> can also can sports tap into some of that meta, uh, metaphysics stuff that <clears throat> doesn't mean that it has to be like religious per se, but they're tapping into a spiritual world uh, that uh, is that is why people sometimes tend to like sports a lot. And uh, I don't know, you know, I, I guess you could freestyle on that a little bit or I could just be wrong, man, you know. <laughs> Well, I, I certainly can't tell you that you're wrong on the metaphysical because I'm not. Yeah, I'm still living in the material world. But uh, no, I, I think I think you, you can go you can go even farther than that. I mean, a lot of times our our you know our uh, modern Protestant evangelical friends tend to shun the material world, right? That it's they might be the ones, for example, standing outside the football game holding up a sign, kind of you know, why are you doing this? You heathen, don't you realize you should be wearing different clothes and your wife's head should be covered and, you know, sports are for the devil. Right. And that's just not a Christian point of view. Like, I'm sorry to our Protestant friends and not all of them obviously are like that, but that particular subset is kind of extra creepy. Um, it's so it's not just <laughs> metaphysical. It's a, it's a, people are playing sports, right? They're, they're coming together as a community to enjoy something together. No different than if they're watching a play or eating a meal, right. Or, you know, just playing a card game. Right. So going to a, to watch a football game, I mean, there is nothing in and of itself that is in any way either good or bad, but it, it, it usually ends up being a manifestation of something good, right. Through that communal activity, through using our God given gifts, right. Our athletic prowess, if we're playing the sport, right. Or maybe we used to play it when we were a kid and we we're kind of reliving some of our youth a little bit through like, for example, I'm old and broken, so I can't play baseball anymore, but I can watch a baseball game and probably like you do with football, dissect every single little thing that's going on. Right. I'm like, Oh, that's why the pitcher did this. And that's a knuckleball. And here's why he threw it there. Right. Um, <clears throat> I think that stuff's really cool. If we don't participate in the material reality, then we're actually not doing our job as human beings from a Christian point of view. Right. If we're just sitting like, for example, once saved, always saved. If you're just sitting around waiting to die so you can go to heaven, that's not actually what you were created to do. You're created to participate in the world just like God participates in the world. And I can't see how there's anything. Not only is there nothing wrong with going to a sporting event, as long as it's not like the gladiator games. Right. And slaves are getting like spears through their necks and lions eating them. <laughs> right. As long as it's just competitiveness, I think it's actually not just not bad it's it's really good to do things like that and to participate in the world you know because otherwise you just end up down this postmodern nihilistic rabbit hole of like everything i where like event evangelism or evangelical protestantism just becomes like postmodernism <laughs> it's just nihilistic right it's all everything's evil everything's terrible i can't leave my house like ah oh, rap music right like <laughs> so yeah no i think it's um I think it's good. And I, I don't think you'd ever find, you know, an Orthodox Christian who would disagree with that. Some of them might not enjoy it as much, maybe because they have different interests. But no, I think it's very important not to lose that sense of structure. Sp sports, I mean, competition, friendly competition in general is basically a hallmark of civilization. Because if you can't have friendly competition, right, then you're at, en um, you're at you're odds with your other human beings in your society, right? If you can't compete without killing each other, then there's a problem. But if you can compete and you can all shake hands at the end of the game and go home, 
I think that's actually proving that your society is on at least a possible right track to success, right? It's showing that you can go up to a certain point of discernment and come back, that you're not lost in it, but you're also allowing yourself to partake in it, to have that level of awareness and discernment to make the decision. And if it starts getting out of hand and all of a sudden, you know, it starts turning into gladiator games, you go, mm, nope, I'm not going to participate in this right now. But as long as it doesn't, yeah, I think everybody should be should be totally into that stuff. Totally, man. Um, that's funny that uh, uh, last night, uh, I think it'd be kind of cool that when I was uh, confirming the conversation, uh, uh, which I think is cool that you had told me, hey, do you know what, uh, what Orale comes from? Uh, and I was like, well, no, not really. And uh, you kind of gave me the like the, the history, not the history, but like the kind of the root word. And then I kind of like was like, oh, OK, that's cool. And then I forgot uh, that, yeah, like in Spanish, like to say, oh, like in Spanish, I remember as a kid, you, you know, even though we weren't very, like as kids, we were more religious than we were as like we got older. But yeah, you, you, you would go say, oh, vamos a ir a orar. Orar was like to go pray or whatever. And I never even thought like, oh, that's, that's orale. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was funny, man. Uh, uh, can, can you kind of uh, 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 give a, a kind of a rundown of how important uh, it is to know like the maybe I want to say the root of words and maybe some of that, I guess the lineages of them, mm. but, but mm. why it is over time important. Like, so I didn't know, but I only cared about what it felt and what it feels to me and what I think it feels to the person in front of me. But I think it's cool to know that like, Hey, I'll, I'll say that the next time I'm saying it to the homies and they're going to be like, no, mom is coming on like, yeah, hey, hey, Adam told me, go check out my podcast, you know, like, uh, uh, like how important or why is it important or why, I, I don't know, like just freestyle a little bit on like why some of these words matter and uh, on the lineages of them. And, 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 uh, and I don't know, man, I thought that was kind of cool, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I basically just Googled it cause it's something <laughs> that you write a lot. <laughs> and I said, I, no, that's an exclamation. It's something like you know, it's probably something like preach or hey man or good, you know, something. So I'm like looked it up and like RR is just to pray, right? So yeah, it, it was interesting to me as sort of a trivia fact, right? But as far as like language itself, um well, you thought it was cool that it meant to pray and that yeah. I I'm always saying it. Yeah. And that I didn't I didn't even know I was always saying it, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I just wanted to make the I didn't know it either. I had like looked it up and just learned it on the fly. But yeah, I think the language thing. Um, it, that this is really where postmodernism sort of has done the most damage. Like postmodernism did a really good job of sort of slamming down modernism, <laughs> but then it didn't really provide anything of value in response. So people were just look, kind of left with a big void and, and language and communication is one of those things. If, as the postmoderns will tell you, if language basically means whatever you want it to mean, then there's really no point in communicating with anybody. Right. And that, is actually to them a positive, right? That's you're pointing out truth. There is no way to really communicate with everything is subjective and therefore nothing really matters and it's all nihilistic and why are we doing anything, right? Just do whatever you want, nothing matters. Um, if you want to take that point, okay. But I, I don't, I don't think you do. So I think it's important that <clears throat> when we're, and I do this a lot on Facebook, which I'm not on very much, but when I go on, I notice a lot of people sort of, they're using the word, words, in the way they've heard other people use words who are probably using it in the way they've heard other people use words and somewhere between that and the actual meaning something gets distorted and it's just being copied copied and pasted copied and pasted copy pasted and it's very easy in english to do that because english is sort of a mixture of so many other languages that it doesn't really have its own structure. I mean, it obviously, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a philologist or like a study of linguistics, but um, it, it has a structure sort of after the fact, right? There's sort of a structure kind of built back into it. But if we're looking and why this is important, for example, is if we're, if we're reading a, a Stephen King book translated into Spanish, it, it doesn't matter, right? Because you're getting basically the gist of the Stephen King story, even if a couple things don't, it doesn't really matter if, the girl walked or the girl ran, right? But it does matter when the text is something that you're using to justify something of huge importance. For example, like life and death, right? Or salvation or damnation, as in the text of scripture. 
when when we look for example at <clears throat> something like a, a modern english bible which of which there are thousands of different translations that are mostly copyrighted by particular printing companies so that they don't have to pay licensing fees to quote other people's bibles right that's talk about capital um we can even go back to the king james version of the bible in 1611 or we can go back even farther whatever if we don't understand what the english word we're reading now where that comes from and what it means or if it's even correct right and by correct i mean the same as when it was written right if we if we use the word faith instead of the word faithfulness you can just that change alone can affect an entire civilization and that's that's why it's important that's why i think can, it's important. can i give you an example of what hmm. you're saying but in terms again of how I see things things through capital. Is that kind of a, an example of like when now we know that like recession means something different than what we knew what it meant. Mm -hmm. And now every new generation is going to think like, like we're going to be the old guys thinking all oh, recession men, uh, I don't know, whatever, two quarters or whatever the whatever the whatever we've always thought it was all oh, a couple quarters, uh, whatever below some type of growth, that's a recession. And now it's not that uh, is, are you kind of saying the same thing a little bit that like, oh, yeah. oh, like, that's the same thing, but it's um, we're, uh, it's it's has a, and like or inflation or, or shit like that you know like that also has you know people might make decisions financial decisions based on like oh the authority said that there, we're not in a recession in a recession but we know that the lineage of the word says that a hey, recession means this you know and uh is that kind of what you're saying a little bit but in the different in a different venue no it, it kind of is and but the the problem well not the problem it's actually good you brought that example up um the word recession right we, we can i don't know the etymology of that word off the top of my head but we could probably take it back somewhere to latin i'm sure and it means to fall back probably recede receptus something like that like fall backwards um to understand what the word means what what is very interesting about people who are like well this is this current new definition of recession is not the previous definition of recession but that previous definition of recession in the way that we're using it to exemplify an economic model is also an arbitrary definition before too, right? <laughs> it's not like when the word was created, it was created from scratch out of nothing, like out of the ether to describe three straight quarters of American stock market. You know what I mean? Like the, the word is arbitrarily applied before and now it's arbitrarily applied differently. So that, that is like, they're like, oh, they're changing words, right? Well, they're, they're, they're not changing the word. They're just changing an arbitrary application of the word, like the, the like vaccine, the, the idea, the word, literally they changed the definition in Oxford dictionary of vaccine to include the stuff that whatever the COVID shot is, which is not a vaccine by previous definitions of vaccination, right? It just isn't. So that's why they obviously had to go change the definition and people are like, well, you change." But the word vaccine before the definition changed a year and a half ago is also an arbitrary definition of a vaccine. Like you have to pick something for a vaccine to be just because it was that before doesn't mean it ha it could have been what it is now. It could literally mean taking a banana and shoving it in your eyeball. <laughs> like it can mean whatever you want it to mean. So I, I think, you know, in, in that sense, the postmodernists kind of got it right, but the answer to that is not to just like throw up our hands and do nothing with words. I think the instinct to want to stay with something is a good instinct, but English just doesn't do a very good job of that. It lends itself to fluctuations for somehow the way we live as human beings doesn't lend itself to the English language. Well, and I don't know why that is, but I've seen that trend and I've heard that said before by people who are way smarter than I am. Um, and I don't really have a reason. I don't know why that happens. I think, and I, my guess is it's because all, most of the words we use are borrowed from somewhere else. Whereas like, obviously concepts are borrowed from some, somewhere else in like Greek or Hebrew or Russian or whatever, <clears throat> but English is really like a mixture of German and Slavic and old Norse, right? It's like this weird amalgamation of things that if you go back to like the King's English, right? Like early modern English, like Shakespeare, the king james bible um it is a lot of things were not even spelled the same way like story to story book to book they're kind of sounded out 
right? And then some things have like an extra U in there or like two L's or like a D where there should be a G. It was kind of like phonetically sort of finagled on the paper. And so, and I, you know, I don't know why that is, but <clears throat> yeah, I think. It's not like a, like a, it's not a language of like, uh, like battle and war as opposed to like, a, maybe like a language like span like, like. Spanish, that's more like, uh, what do they, they call it? The, the romance languages or whatever they, they, they is, you know, it's almost like when you're saying that, I was thinking like, well, you know, the reason it doesn't work, it's because culturally there's, you know, there's people coming from the South and there's more influence of like Spanish speaking. So it's kind of like, if you were looking like at a dance floor, the, the English ones still can't dance and they want to, and the other ones are dancing and you know so that's what there's a there's a little bit of like, like I, I, that's just the way i think you know that's just yeah, my maybe, thinking maybe you know i i wish i was uh more versed in it to know but it seems like there you know other languages that i've sort of flirted with there's a lot less room for ambiguity in the way the language was set up and in english there is a lot of room for maneuverability and ambiguity and i don't know why that is it just seems to be the case and and somebody can reach out and tell me that i'm wrong too i'm open to that but it it just fe it feels that way and i've heard a lot of people in the study of philology the study of languages uh, bring that up um so to kind of uh get here to the the end of the conversation right now you had said that uh uh there's like a there's in many a natural uh, instinct to to keep with like the tradition of words and stuff like that. And uh, can you speak a little bit to then if that is the same natural instinct for people that are, I guess I'm paying, a, I've been paying attention more that people are looking more into like uh, the, the Eastern Orthodoxy that that or what they, and you can like tell me like the claim is that that's more closer to the originalist or something like that of the texture of the of the of the of what was said in the bibles and all that and is that the natural that, that same instinct that i just felt a little bit of like oh like or like every a lot of people feel like oh you can't just change the definition of the word is that the same instinct that why some people grasp onto or or, or like go towards like the orthodox the, the the eastern orthodoxy church like what's been going on lately or like that or that you've been kind of getting into more or that mm -hmm. i've noticed that people have been getting more into like uh uh is that the same instinct and 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 if it is then um you know i don't know speak a little bit to to what that means for like you and what that might mean to people that get into it and 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 people that will that want to listen to your show and you know what do they what can they expect uh to to get into a little bit on your show mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think the reason that somebody should, there's a lot of reasons I've noticed why people are flirting with Orthodox Christianity right now. Um, a, a lot of them are, I can understand. And some of them are a little bit on the creepy side. Uh, I would say the reason that you should join. What's the any, creepy side? What does creepy side mean? Like what, what does that mean? So, so if you're, if you're, if your reason for wanting to join let's say the Russian Orthodox church is that the current Baptist organization that you're in right now, or Presbyterian church or something in your local town uh, ordains women or has a, a rainbow flag outside. And that's your reason for wanting to go join an Orthodox church. Okay. Um, don't go there. <laughs> don't. The only reason that you should go to any church really, but specifically the Orthodox Church, is because you feel the presence of Christ there. If there's any other reason that you're going, other than to just gather information, but if your motivation is any other reason, then you should probably take your time and work through some things in your heart first. And the the, the priests there, th they'll let you know. They'll be honest with you about, you know, your your, your level of kind of what you need to level up or down in order to be received and receive back. Right. So I think that's important. But as far as like, from just a general sort of interest level, right. The kind of thing that we might be talking about that someone's like, Oh, I, you know, I, I find these factual things you're talking about, Adam, to be interesting to my brain. Right. Um, what, what I see there through many of the reasons that we've, we've discussed already is a, a truer, and more simple presentation of what early Christianity was, which isn't a throwback, right? When you have a historical unbroken line going back to the literal word on the page in the, in the Bible, 
And the Roman Catholic Church can make this claim too, by the way, right? Because you know they just they just can. So, but the the problem with with Rome is they built a lot of structures on top, and Orthodoxy didn't do that, right? They refined some things or they made some things prettier as far as like aesthetically pleasing, but the essential core principle is not um, manipulated by a bunch of like systematic theological modernism. For example, if you go and you look at like, go to like Oxford Press <clears throat> online or something and look at it like a 19th century, you know, like early 1800s, middle 1800s book on Protestant systemic theology, like it's laughable now having just gone through the last two years, like laughable. It's one of those, like we can pull the data of the theology Paul is writing in, you know, his letter to the Corinthians, he's writing a literal systematic theology. We can pull data points out and using the science of the letters, we can put together, this is how you worship God. Like it's laughable now, right? It just having gone through the last three years, like literally LOL. And what you're going to get in an Orthodox church, you're not going to get, you're, you're not going to go in there and get an hour long sermon about what you literally do step by step to go to heaven. You're, or whatever they talk about, <laughs> you're going to participate in a ritual that in its current form goes back at least 17, 18, or 16, 1700 years, right? To St. John Christ Christosom. And you're going to participate in something. And through that ritual, you are going to break down barriers that you've put up that cause danger and harm to yourself and others around you. And you're going to learn to participate in a community that's hopefully doing the same thing. And and that is ultimately, I think, the goal of any particular Christian flavor or denomination or, or whatever. But I would just ask people to look at the fruits, look what look what comes out, right? Look at the product. And this is a long conversation. This could go on for hours. The topic we're talking about. I'll try to wrap up for the sake of brevity. the The idea that what you're ultimately looking for is something you can actually achieve while you're in this world for the most part, is just not something you're going to get in Western Christianity, like at all. But you will get it if you read just the New Testament, read the Gospels and Paul's epistles. You'll get it if what you're looking at there, you realize is specifically with Paul. And I don't know how familiar you are with the Bible, but I'm sure you're, at least if I say a letter that Paul wrote, mm -mm. there's one of those in there. Just no, like man. Of them. All right. Well, there is. <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you look if you read that and you read it as here's a human being who is writing a letter to other human beings who literally lived in this place at this time about things that are happening in this place and at this time and through that communicating a message to them of how they should live and why that's what you're going to get as your quote unquote theology and orthodoxy you're going to get real human beings doing real things and why they did them. What you're not going to get is St. Paul sit da sat down and wrote the book of Romans as a systematic theology book. And we must take all of these literally as if he wrote them in English in 2022, which he most certainly didn't. He wrote it in Greek and not even the same Greek as the Greek we speak now. So <laughs> that that's another reason why I think concepts and translations and words and ritual matter. Like, because you become what you do. Right. If you practice football, you know, 10 hours a day for your whole life and have a moderate athletic prowess, you could probably be a football player. Right. I mean, as long as your body can handle the, the pressure and the, and the muscle build and the athleticism, you practice enough, you're probably going to be pretty dope if you don't get hurt. So the idea of Christianity being a ritual, the same as you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, take a shower, take the dog out, make sure the kids are fed. Take, that's a ritual. Right. And that becomes your family structure that creates something for you of love that bonds you together. Christianity is the same way. And if we lose that ritual, if we lose that pulling back to the originalness of it, the originalness of, of humanity, then yeah, we're going to lose the whole thing. And the spiritual battle that I talk about, we don't have any connection to the spiritual world anymore. Or even worse, if we're told that it doesn't exist, then we've already lost. We're not going to make it. So there's a lot of different moving factors in there. And you know, if somebody wants to reach out to me about where they can get probably better information than I can provide on this, I can certainly point them in the direction of a, you know, a book or a podcast or a series or, 
you know, point them in the direction of a, any church they want, or even if they want to explore their own particular faith, where they are, you know, give them a little bit of a history of where their particular theology comes from and who has influenced those words and those feelings and those stories. Um, and then it just at least floods the world with information that is accurate information so that people can then make a more informed decision because everybody is dissecting the world according to their own point of view. And this is impossible to escape. Everybody has their own perspective. Everybody has their own point of view. What I think we should try to do as people who want to help and influence other human beings is be as honest and accurate about what we know to be true from our point of view and not try to use that in any way to solicit them or manipulate them or control them to just lay it out there and admit when we're wrong and, and, and work together to find just what the truth is. And then people can, when they have all of the information, they can make a more informed decision. And this is not, I don't think what like an Orthodox priest would tell you to do. They would just tell you to come to the liturgy and work through it over time with them. Right. But I think our modern American democratic world, we, we have to adjust that a little bit. And I'm, I'm sort of seeing the Orthodox church in America kind of make that adjustment, but not quite know how to not take it too far. Right. And still how to, how to do it kind of the way they see to be true. Um, I think it's in our culture, we kind of have to, like, there isn't a way to just sort of have the, the general mindset to sort of adopt the spiritual world. It's like so foreign to our modern Western brains that we kind of just dismiss it as like a movie fact or something. Um, so I think that 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 is going to be really important moving forward to be like, well, like, like, for example, I'll answer the questions that you're asking me, right? I'm not going to try to insert some other idea in here, or crowbar an idea here. So if somebody says to me, like, well, uh, Mormonism, for example, is the recreation of the religion of the apostles in the Bible. Like we live in a world now where we can actually just not assume that's true or untrue. We can actually go find that out. Right. And then if it just comes down to whether or not you believe something spiritual happened or didn't, well, then you can't really prove that. Right. <laughs> but we could easily say like, okay, well, where did it quote unquote go wrong? Okay. Well, let's go there and then point to the spot where it did like, okay, now we have all this information. where did it go wrong? Cause you can't just say that. Right. So I think that's just to tie that all up for you kind of answers your question of where I want to take the age of information. I want, I want it to be a place where, you know, I am not going to be, um, I'm a subject, I'm very subjective and I have a point of view and I'm going to express that point of view because I believe that point of view to be true, but I'm still on a journey, right. To do things and work things out. Same as I was on, on the previous show, right. On your talking over me. Um, but I want to cut through all of those filters and get as much accurate information out into the market as possible for people to have to make an informed decision so they stop making bad decisions, <laughs> right? Because I love them and care about them and want to help heal things, help heal people to help repair, to help put things back in order and not cause harm and not cause chaos and not contribute to that. And of course, that's going to help by defining what order and chaos even means, which is what I hope the show can do. It's they're very specific things in the way I mean them. And I'm not making that up subjectively. It's actually literally in the text. Right. And so I want to do that. I want to take modernism and I want to take postmodernism and I want to take pre-modernism and I want to, I want to get rid of those designations and just give people one thing, right. From my perspective, that's without perfect. having all those other filters in there. So yeah, that, that's kind of the goal. Yeah, cool, man. Uh, yeah, I'd like to say uh, thank you for coming on again. Um, uh, I definitely want to have you back on to uh, talk about more of this. And uh, I'm going to be uh, definitely tuning in to uh, your show. Uh, uh, I did uh, when it was the other one. I know you took like a little break. Um, little. And, uh, but I know you're going to try to get back in the mix. So where can people uh, uh, reach you? Uh, reach the show exactly and then maybe reach out to you directly like you said uh, uh hmm. for us uh you know yeah, so probably the uh, best place right now i had some time last week so i went on and just changed the website and i changed the email and probably on podcatchers it changed the name of the podcast 
but I don't think it changed the description. I don't think I changed the color scheme or like the graphics or whatever, but um, the best place would be just the age of information.com. I was super lucky to be able to snag that URL for free. Like nice. I, it, it was thousands and thousands of dollars like last year. So I got it for free and it's so it's Adam at age of information.com. That's it. It's like super simple. Perfect, man. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Like I said again, and uh, we'll catch you on the, on the next one, man. Peace. Thanks, Carlos. Peace.